Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph Xavier. Thank you for coming to this webinar. I am the Marketing Manager for Innovation Engineering. I'd like to introduce uh, the speakers, Alan Dubot, uh, the design engineer and our main speaker for this webinar, uh, supported by Todd Kohling, the SOC, uh, SOC product at Altera, a senior marketing manager, and Stefan Rossinger. Uh, this is Todd Kelling with Altera. I'll go ahead and walk through the, the agenda here, and then uh, Joseph, you can tell us a little more about innovation. Um, so we started with the introduction, uh, and uh, we'll have Alan join us in just a minute. This is Todd Kelling, also on the line of Stefan from ARM. We're going to look at this case study today that Innovation put together, which compares the traditional FPGA engineering design flow to one using an SOC FPGA. Uh, they did some great work here, looking at both the ARM and Altera design and development environment, looking at the system ARM architecture, system integration and bring up, as well as achieving customer satisfaction through really understanding those requirements. Excellent. So I we're believe that. We'll walk through those things at a high level, and then we'll look at the video case by client case study. Great. And I believe Alan is with us now. Alan? Yes, I am. Can everybody hear me okay? Sounds good to me. Sounds good. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I was online. I guess nobody else could hear me. Okay. So I'm now on my new webinar, as you can see. The, uh, I just want to quickly introduce myself. So I've been uh, with Innovation since uh, 2010. I've been involved in uh, FPGA design since 1988. I claim to fame is I don't think I have gone through one year without doing at least one FPGA design. Very happy to, to be here and uh, having this opportunity to talk to us about Altera and the ARM. So a quick introduction is what we're going to do from now. I'm this is Todd Kelling. I'm Product Line Manager for the SSC FPJ Portfolio at Altera. I've been with Altera for three years, beginning with the launch of our first SSC FPJ in 2011. And that has spent the majority of my career at Intel, along with various other products. Thank you, Todd. Hi, Stefan. Hi, this is Stefan Rosenberg. Uh, I'm ARM CQ Product Manager. Uh, and Cortex A9 is one of my products, uh, and I've been in this role since 2010, uh, looking after the Cortex A9, which is being applied uh, by Altera as an example customer, as well as the end customers like Innovation Engineering. Thank you very much, Stefan. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to start uh, by talking about a comparison of the impact of traditional FPGA engineering um, design flow. And the main focus that I wanted to uh, establish here and the main reason why I had put the, this presentation together is to uh, address the fact that because of the, the new SOC style that, that we're seeing, and I know it doesn't sound like it's new, but with the arm being inside the fabric and coherency and data coherency, that I, it's kind of like I'm putting out a call there and say we have to rethink how we uh, put together and we attack uh, system design problems because now we have a new infrastructure that we can take advantage of. And that's the whole real premise that I'm trying to put together uh, here. So that's uh, in the second, uh, first section we're going to be covering. And then after that, I'm going to apply everything we talked about to a case study that we did a video pipeline evaluation platform. I'll present a lot of these points that I'm talking about during that evaluation. So I'm going to start by just saying hello, everybody. Innovation this is a great company. Main thing I want to uh, mention here is that we're a company we move fast without compromising quality, and that's the essence of who we are. Uh, we have a very strong leadership, and uh, we've done loads of designs with FPGA, at board level, every type of design imaginable. So please feel free to visit our website and give us a call. And we have partnerships uh, with Altera and ARM that have been involved uh, since uh, 1998, as you can see. And with that, I'm going to allow Todd to take over. So at the heart of our discussion today is the SOC FPGA. So I just want to touch on this briefly, what it is, for any of you who may not have heard about it. This is a new class of product which combines an ARM processor, in this case a dual-core ARM Cortex-A9, with our latest FPGA fabric. And the benefits of this single-chip approach are the higher performance, lower power, lower cost, smaller board space compared to the two-chip solution. And then next, I'd like to give you some background on the people behind the product. Now, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, I just did. So Altera is best known for our FPGAs. At Altera, we have three technology centers aiming up to bring you SOC products, software, and solutions. 
On the left is our FPGA team in San Jose, California, developing the FPGA design and development tools. On the right, we have the system solutions group based in the UK. We put all the pieces together into system level solutions, such as industrial motor control or wireless motor control backhaul. But the group I want to focus on is the one in the middle. And this is the Austin Technology Center, which Altera established solely for the purpose of developing SOP FPGA. The Austin team integrates processor cores and develops the embedded software, most notably Linux OS cores. The site is headed by Ty Garibay, who prior to Altera was director of engineering for the OMAP product at PI. And he has assembled a top-notch team of over 100 engineers with deep processor experience to develop these products. And I want to focus on this because I think it demonstrates all work and commitment to the SOP FPGA product line. And Stefan, next over to you. Yeah, hello, Stefan speaking. So uh, just a little brief doubt on what ARM does. Uh, many of you will know ARM from designing processes, uh, but actually these days it's much, much beyond processor technology. It's just basically one part where we are with processors really in products that start in processes and just really going nowadays into the server. I like, for example, you know, Paris SSD, which goes into automotive type application, industrial type application, but also smartphones, tablets, uh, base stations. Those are really uh, applications where ARM is found today. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, I have one uh, slide showing you the breadth of the ARM, ARM solution beyond uh, just the processor. Uh, so we are looking at the smartphones, example, we have technology like the Cortex technology for the processors, uh, and those you will usually find in application type processors, so like the Cortex A9 is an application process. This will find us in many, many other uh, SOCs and technology, um, the technologies, like for example in the modem technology as well as Bluetooth, GPS, power management, and even down to the sensors, as I said before. Um, so we have various technologies like the Mali graphics as well, which uh, really drive GPU as well as, uh, as as well as display solutions, uh, really down to the artisan technology, which is the physical actual layer. So if you go to the next slide, um, I try to uh, give you an overview of uh, basically what ARM really really delivers, and it really is uh, to our partners, really from top to bottom, uh, a solution. So we, we basically provide the, the underlying physical IP uh, as well as the graphics and system IP solution, which allows partners like our to build um, their chip, um, they speak like uh, an ATX provider, then they can strip uh, their FPGA logic around it, and of course on top of that, that is all really backed up and, and supported by the software ecosystem as well. So ARM really is, uh, of course, very established in the mobile uh, consumer market and that really drives into all other, other markets that have been used before. So now I would like to hand over uh, back to, um, to Alex. Stefan for that introduction. So here's one thing that I, I really want to focus on is that it's important that all the pieces of the puzzle come together for us to be able to want to leverage and harness the power of what Altera is uh, introducing here. And one of the things that uh, for those of you that, that go as far back as I do, that this is not a new solution. This is a much better solution than what was offered before there was a attempt to do this. And part of the heart of why I believe that this is going to be a very successful endeavor is because of the fact that you have a very mature design and development uh, platform. And I'm going to hand that over to Todd. Yeah, so at Altera, when we set up to do this, this innovative new silicon, we realized that we need to have great software to go with it to enable it, because what good is the silicon if the software doesn't enable it. And while the GNU tools, specifically the GDB debugger, are very popular in industry, uh, a little known fact is that the GDB debugger was actually designed for single core systems and it's kind of been stretched out to multi-core. Whereas when we looked at this, we realized that the ARM Development Studio tools were actually designed and architected with multi-core in mind. So we approached ARM to see if they could come up with a solution for handling this unique device. And they developed an ARM Development Studio 5 version called the Altera Edition Toolkit, which is targeted for these SOP FPJ devices. And the beauty of this is that rather than having two tools and, and two different they connect everything, you can have just a single cable, the USB Blaster 2 cable, 
and you can see both parts of the device. So it's what we call FPGA adaptive debugging, and it allows you to see both the processor and the FPGA at the same time. Stefan, why don't I turn it over to you next to give us some more details on that. Sure. So if you look at the uh, DS5 solution, the Altaria Edition solution, really what it gives you is, uh, as Todd was saying before, the FPGA adaptive uh, debugging solution. That means you can basically debug the Core J9 uh, and C Code Dual Core on the and single core on the chip, uh, as well as you can debug uh, logic in the FPGA. But really, you have basically one common tool that really removes the, the barrier of debugging between CPUs and FPGAs. So you really only need one tool. Um, and the beauty really is that you have basically technology uh, called the foresight on foresight technology that allows you to really synchronize, uh, especially the debug part uh, between the FPGA and the ARM processor. Uh, basically, you can do things like uh, cross trigger uh, one CPU to uh, one ARM CPU, for example, uh, logic on the FPGA, which basically allows you to stop, let's say, all processors or all logic from working so you can actually uh, have a nice snapshot of the whole system and really investigate um, uh, any issues you might you might want to investigate. So it really is a technology that really spans across a typical traditional um, uh, typical additional uh, traditional ARM process system and really spans now into the space where you can have uh, a logic with your own user logic. Uh, and of course, it doesn't stop there. Uh, the tool basically also gives you the option to generate the, the registers used of your FPGA, so whatever you basically program uh, and design in your FPGA logic, uh, that will be visible in the D5 debugger. So it's a really beautiful solution, uh, basically, for that. And if you go to the next slide, I want to show you, uh, just you basically go beyond the traditional debug, meaning that you just basically stop your processes from, from, from working and you investigate the, uh, an issue you might, might have. It really allows you uh, with our streamlined performance in analyzers to also basically analyze the performance of your software in that particular uh, FPGA SSD solution. So effectively, it allows you to do performance uh, exploration using uh, OS counters. You basically can use a full OS on the Cortex A9, and that will give you um, information about the CPU load, about any network uh, memory accesses, etc. Uh, and this is all supported basically through our CPU counters for each of the Cortex A9 has uh, CPU counters that can count things like clock cycles, destruction, TLB messages, etc. That really allows you to um, get the, the best performance out of, out of your solution. Um, and yeah, we have debug tools. So Terra offers their USB Blaster 2 solution, which comes for free um, as a developer. And of course, if you want to take it a step further, ARM offers their D-Stream solution, which basically allows you to, to have a full elaborate um, debugging and performance analysis of the system. So I'm going to let the hand over again. Thank you very much, Todd. Uh, so Alan, back. So what I'm going to do is that a lot of this that I'm covering here will be actually covered during the case study. So I'll just go through the slides a little, you know, a little bit quicker than I'm not going to read everything. Quickly, the point that I want to make here is that uh, what's really nice is that because now we've got this architecture, what we want to do is that we want to get our customers uh, to be aware that, hey, look, there's a new uh, approach. We don't have to take a traditional approach. So what we'll do is that we profile and we assess exactly what the client's uh, requirements are. And then we take a look and say, yeah, you know what? This would fit beautifully in an SOC. And the beauty of this is the fact that you can save a lot of time and money and risk mitigation by not having to commit early on to a lot of high-speed interaction between, uh, let's say, an off-chip uh, uh, off uh, CPU and FPGA. You take a look here, the tight integration between HPS and FPGA fabric, 100 incredible. The other thing, too, is that you can actually tap and have the interaction between the FPGA and the ARM to be actually very dynamic. So you don't have to commit early on, and that really allows you to do a lot of parallel uh, cycling during the development of the project. I'm going to hand this over to Todd to talk about. Yeah, in terms of Tools. The key thing here was really to keep tools that people are familiar with, traditional interfaces, and tools that they're used to using, not making a big new hurdle to go over. So for both the 
hardware engineers as well as the software engineers. That was our goal on the flows. So on the left-hand side, you can see the hardware development. This is using our standard Altera FPGA development tool, specifically the Cortis 2 as well as the QSYS system integration tool to piece all the blocks together. And on the right-hand side, we have the software development flow. This uses a standard Eclipse-based IDE. And of course, the ARM Development Studio 5 our program is great for using this, as well as the new tool chain, all the standard OSs, and so on. So you've really got tools that both the hardware engineer and the software engineer are very familiar with. And the key is to link those two together, and that's the hardware to software handoff. And that comes from the Cortis 2 files and the QSIS files. We have that all set up so those files can easily transfer over to the software development environment, and the software programmer can just program as usual. Thank you, Todd. So what I wanted to talk about, so it's system architecting. Here's a typical innovation methodology. And I talked about we do we move very fast when it comes to doing development and things like that. And there's two processes. We have a prototype process, and we have IDM, which is for design for manufacturing. So here's an example of our process for the methodology for designing a prototype. And one aspect that I want to mention here is that the fact that you don't have to commit early on allows us to have more parallel processing, what we call our phases. So we can do some forward bring up phases. We have some early development uh, that we can actually start without having to commit. We're going to see that that we uh, study, so we give a better example of that. Again, here's an example of IBM having that ARM processor inside there, and all the hard IP will really allow us to take advantage and uh, be able to implement many of the uh, methodologies that's found in IBM that normally would take additional effort. That we'll actually see those really nice overlapping uh, abilities uh, to be uh, taken advantage. So again, just talking about the uh, the data coherency, and this is where the key is. This is where we can really take advantage, but we have to be able to do that early on in the system architecting. Um, Todd, uh, want to talk about this? Yeah. So while there are many benefits from the integration of the single chip in terms of the performance and power and so on, there's actually times where you want it to behave like two different chips. Uh, for example, the power up sequence. Maybe you want the CPU to boot first and then the FPGA, or vice versa. Maybe you want the FPGA to boot first and configure and secure the system first and then bring up the, the CPU. So we actually allowed that in this, uh, this chip. So we really thought through when we architected this chip, what are the, the use models, what are the data flows that are going to be optimum for each of the different applications. Go ahead, Todd. Okay, go ahead. That's what I'll just step on for the on the processor system. Yeah, so when you when you look at the Altera, it's really an exciting system. So it basically consists of the hard processor system, uh, which I will talk more about, and, and the FPGA logic as well as external interfacing, which which Todd is going to be uh, talking more about. But if you look into into the HPS system, uh, it basically is a hardened hardened Cortex A9 system, like what we see today on any traditional ASIC. Um, it really is basically uh, a full a full blown um, processing system consisting of uh, either single or dual core for the case. In, uh, and in terms of the processor, it, it of course comes with uh, the Neon technology, this uh, basically acceleration technology for things like video, audio codecs, decodes, uh, as well as any other industrial um, applications you might want to use it for, uh, as well as flow different units. Of course, is is, uh, is absolutely standard these days. Um, as well as it has, of course, uh, caching structures, so the L1 caches in, in Cortex A9, as well as the L2 caches. Um, and as, as uh, Alan was saying before, the beauty of basically this, this dual core, single core system is that if you have two, two cores, basically have full coherent um, the foster subsystem uh, within, within the, the Cortex A9. Uh, basically, it's back for uh, SMT uh, technology, symmetric multi processing technology. Uh, and when you go beyond that, uh, Altera has put together a really nice system, uh, basically supporting all kinds of IOs, for example, GPIOs, S2T, Ethernet, uh, USBs, all of really very important, um, very important IOs are coming directly out of that HPS system. And of course, also the connection to the FPGA. So this is really where FPGA 
scale logic where, where you as a, as a user can basically program your own user logic uh, and of course interface into the uh, HPS system. Um, as well as on the external side, uh, Todd will, I'll hand over to Todd, will uh, talk more about the external connection from the, um, from the SSP into the external system. So on the FPGA side, there's additional hardened purple logic, such as additional memory controllers, also a hardened PCIe interface, as well as various transceivers of different speeds for any high-speed interfaces you might have there. But the other exciting part about the FPGA logic is that if there are any peripherals that are missing, well, you can customize this device to be exactly what you need. So you could add additional Ethernet ports or additional USB ports, whatever you'd like to do. And that's a, really a customized SSD. Thank you very much. Yeah, I lost a little bit of time at the beginning, so I'm just going to, as I said, all of this will be covering uh, in the case study through risk mitigation. And one thing that I want to mention is that having that processor inside there and having that data coherency will really allow and uh, lend itself very nicely to what we call a stepwise development to integration process. So, you know, part of risk mitigation is being able to uh, stepwise uh, enable things and test things out, whether it's board uh, level aspect that you want to make sure is working. So because of the power or processor, there's a lot of uh, elements within the FPGA that you can actually bypass and have the ARM processor using a Linux uh, environment to be able to do some, you know, smaller smaller aspects of the design, let's say for a video pipeline, you'll do 720p instead of the 4K video that you want to do, but you can establish that whole, uh, uh, that whole flow and be able to uh, show uh, to the client that, you know, here the, the board is working and we have a sample design and it, it, now we're going to kick in the FPGA and, you know, in another week and stuff like that. So that's the, the part of the beauty of being able to have the coherency and how it does have a nice impact on uh, system integration. So talking about system integration and bring up a little bit of uh, what I was talking about as well uh, for risk mitigation, it allows uh, us to help the client. Uh, we've been doing that uh, non-stop for many years, but this allows us to have uh, more ability to add the board bring up aspects of it uh, where we can actually have more functionality and not have to uh, spend uh, basically weeks trying to uh, map that out in architecture and design it in, in RTL. So here's an example of a, of a company that I had bumped into uh, last year, and this is a third-party company that basically is doing what I'm talking about here, and, and what they do is that they do hardware acceleration, and you hear about this a lot, so we get FPGA hardware acceleration for simulation, but they're, what they're doing is that they're actually doing a lot of test vectors, and they're using a whole environment that they came up with, and this kind of power that you're seeing here is what's available and with the Cyclone 5 SOC. You can uh, put in this kind of concept into your, your to commit into it right away if you're doing an IBM, something that you would want to consider and you don't have to consider it. So just lastly, because I want to try and get to our uh, case study, and we're talking about uh, achieving customer satisfaction. And one of the aspects that, uh, that we see a lot is customers, you know, they want to see milestones being met and things like that by being able to have a higher level of abstraction for data input, uh, such as, uh, as I mentioned, the video pipeline, where you want to see some video coming out and things like that, we're getting some milestones, we've got our auto white balance working, that you're able to do that. So the case study actually will talk about that as well. The other aspect, too, is the what-if scenarios, the okay. potential corner cases. So here I have an example where we actually implemented this. So this is actually an, an example of, of using a processor and an FPGA where the FPGA manipulated the, the data that the uh, processor was going to see. And it was a very hard to debug case. Uh, the, the manufacturer couldn't shut down the, their processing. So what was happening is that there was an optical glitch. And so what we see here on the bottom is the always dead misaligned. This is actually that was uh, controlled in software and it ran through the upper layer of software to see if there was a way that they could handle uh, this glitch and bypass it because they could change the hardware. So that's an example of what I was talking about. So again, talking about reliability, which is we can add more stuff. If you raise the level of abstraction for the amount of effort that you put in, you can get more bang for the buck. So being able to take advantage of, let's say, the Linux environment and putting software routines there is a lot faster than having to manipulate uh, RTL code. 
All right, so what I wanted to do is uh, I want to concentrate really on this case study. So everything I just talked about uh, with uh, Todd and Stefan was actually leading up uh, more or less to this. So this is uh, an actual design that, that was done on an Altera Cyclone 320K, so it's a pretty large device. Uh, that was done a while back, so we didn't have the SSD at the time. That case study where we had actually had some uh, uh, newer designs perfect SOC design. This is an example of one as well. So this uh, here has all the numbers. We did it in 17 calendar weeks. It was uh, 1,600 uh, engineering hours. So it, was a, it was quite a large project and we took advantage or we had to take advantage of a NEOS uh, to soft, uh, embedded soft board. So there was actually two boards. Uh, I won't be talking about the, the first board but I'm using it in the case study because of uh, we have all the timelines and time frames efforts that we uh, used to develop this uh, product uh, with the client. And the FPGA Cyclone 3 board is one we're concentrating on. And actually what that was was a full video pipeline. And um, I'll go into a little bit more details over here. So here's the development and debug tool change system. So now I'm going to just talk about the, uh, the tool flow. So on the left hand side in gray the Cyclone 5 SOC compared to the FPGA only solution. So the FPGA only solution required that we did a NEOS, but because we were using a NEOS, it doesn't have the horsepower that the ARM does. So we really had to spend some time to uh, architecture it properly, to find out the uh, custom user interface that the client wanted, and they wanted a custom user interface on the, the Windows platform. So we had to develop, and we literally spent, I would say, over 90-something hours. We'll see that in the uh, template later on. Uh, just to be able to nail that information down so that we could actually start doing the coding and for both the FPG as well as the software. And so one one aspect that I want to mention here is that the fact that in the Cyclone 5 uh, SOC is that you already have Linux, you already have Ethernet, we wouldn't have had to worry uh, about this uh, configuration between the custom user interface and the PC. So that was one aspect of uh, the design itself. Hardware, software design, partitioning. So we already had a good idea of how we were going to partition it. However, as I mentioned, there was a, um, there was considerable effort that was required on the initial architecture because of the fact that we had the NEOS. We didn't want to have an external uh, processor. The NEOS could do it, but we knew it didn't have a lot of horsepower, so we really had to sit down and partition the architecture a lot. This is a, a no-brainer uh, for the... Uh, SOC. So that would have been a, quite an easy uh, effort uh, to do that. So here what happened is that it, it delayed a lot of the initial uh, phase uh, work for the FPGA as well as for the software. So talking about the integrated hard IT, so not only talking about the ARM, but we're talking about the integrated uh, peripherals that surround the ARM. And that also includes the memory. So in this design here, we had two soft uh, cores and what happened is that uh, there's, because of the design, it was actually quite full. Um, well, uh, it was about 70% uh, when we were adding all our testing and all that. It was actually difficult uh, to meet uh, timing for these uh, DVRs. And so it didn't mean we couldn't do it. It just meant it required more effort. We had to go back to a little bit more you know, placement constraints and what have you. So it, it takes a lot more effort to do that. So when you think about work with uh, Arda, uh, DDRIP, it makes it a lot easier. So here again, just talking about the more uh, hard IP, and as was mentioned uh, earlier by uh, Stefan, he was talking about the I2C and the SPI. Well, lo and behold, you know, aren't we using both the I2C and the SPI in, the, in this design? And so what happens is that, well, not only is it nice to have the hard IP, but you also have to take into account that you have to write the NEOS 2 drivers for that as well. So you know, maybe it doesn't take a long time, but it takes time. You have to deepen all that aspect that surrounds uh, when you're developing new software, and, and also because it's an FPGA core, it takes up resources and all that stuff. So the beauty here is that uh, this solution would have uh, just had us use the Linux, and that's already built in. And just as an example, one of the projects that we did, which used both i c and Spy, we got that up and running in two hours. So it's just something where the choice of the peripheries, uh, the hard peripheries that were selected uh, by uh, Altera for the SOC, I think uh, 
really hit a lot of uh, common uh, design elements that you'll see out there in the marketplace. Um, here we have another thing. Now this is really interesting and what actually happened here is that the client was counting on using uh, USB uh, 2.0 to be able to uh, uh, transfer the data across. They wanted to do some video captures and, and stuff like that. And he didn't, didn't work properly. And of course with the Cyclone 5 SOC, Ethernet, that is the way to do it. Unfortunately here using the USB we have to do a lot of custom work. And, uh, I shouldn't say we lost a lot of time. That was just that was the element of that design. Whereas with the Cyclone 5 SOC just using the Ethernet being able to harness or take advantage of pre-existing and uh, pre-qualified uh, coding would have just been uh, so easy and uh, cost very little uh, effort uh, and money for the client. So here what I did is that uh, I'm going to compare the uh, actual Cyclone uh, 5 with uh, the Cyclone 3 design. So we took the design and I actually put it through the Cyclone uh, 5. And what we have in the Cyclone 5 is that it doesn't even use the largest part. And so this is quite a significant part in uh, the Cyclone 3. And so in terms of uh, routing and placement and all that, all those I'm, we're not seeing here, but it takes a lot less time to do that. So here I am just, I'm just actually taking the design and taking a look at which device it actually fits in. And a lot of these are package uh, compliant. And uh, so typically what we would advise customers is uh, for some prototypes we would go for the uh, 5 CSDA 5 for prototyping and another prototype board with the smaller device so that you know we don't have to deal with uh, you know trying to squeeze uh, anything in or if there was some uh, inadvertent uh, things that we had uh, wanted to add some more features that we'd be able to add that. So some functional requirements. So. As I mentioned, uh, there was some uh, image capture uh, that the client wanted, and the image capture rate was actually quite slow because they ended up having to go with a custom uh, interface, and so the customer would have really liked to have increased that, and there was no physical way that we could uh, increase it. So that's something where, you know, they had an initial requirement, we met the initial requirement, but later on they went, oh man, it would have been just so nice if we could have at least you know, doubled it or four times that, whereas with the cycle. So see, it would have been about uh, 30 times faster than what they had uh, asked for initially. So, and I, again, I talk about unforeseen changes in external requirements. So the USB 2 port didn't work. <laughs> so they had uh, problems with that. So we had to scramble and then help our client uh, with that. There was an off-the-shelf port that they had uh, selected. So they went with a, a, a GPIO. So there wasn't a lot of uh, options that we could do. And again, with Cyclone 5 SOC, there, there, we wouldn't have even be talking about this slide here had, uh, had we been able to select that, that part for this design. So further uh, cost uh, savings in terms of uh, co-verification or time debugging. Uh, the, the video frame work that we did was a custom design video processor. And uh, it, it was quite significant. It was very modern. Like anything, uh, you know, it took a while to qualify, get all those corner cases. So there's a lot of elements of the video pipeline that were difficult to debug just because a lot of the debugging, uh, you can imagine simulation flow of how long that takes in, in an F for an FPGA. And so what happens is that you have to do a lot of onboard uh, debugging for corner cases and things like that. So what happens is that with the ARM, the power of the ARM, you're able to actually put in a lot of these test vectors, a lot of these test patterns uh, that can be utilized to test some of these very difficult The odd white balance thing is actually uh, quite challenging. Sensor raw data and input raw data. <laughs> raw data interface was also uh, something that uh, the original uh, specification and board uh, from the client didn't work. So we had to actually write our own um, uh, interface for that to, to mimic it. And it would have been just, uh, the ARM, uh, even with the, with the NEOS, we weren't set up to do something like that. So here's an example, uh, just a partial uh, block diagram of what I'm talking about. So this is the, the design that was implemented. And you can, if you take a look at the flow, and, and what I'm talking about here in the flow is that the beauty of an SOC, the beauty of the data coherency, that at any point in time, 
uh, you can test pattern the DDR controllers that we can actually utilize uh, the ARM to implement some test patterns and, and a lot more elaborate at a much higher level of abstraction. And the amount of effort to do that would have been minimal. So here I'm just uh, profiling uh, some of the numbers here. So uh, for 1080p60, so we're just taking a look at you know different uh, data rates. Uh, the one that we actually ended up doing was the 36-bit. Uh, so the example that I'm showing here is that the final design is 1080p60. It has uh, quite a high uh, bandwidth and a lot of the processing, as we can see. Sorry, I'm just going to go back one slide. As we can see in the uh, video uh, pipeline. So what the point that I was making is that using the ARM, we don't have to go at the highest uh, resolution. We could use a subset of that resolution to be able to qualify a lot of blocks, as well as to help unblock, uh, let's say, the, the customer that was doing the user interface uh, part of it. And you know, until everything is ready, it, 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 it was difficult to be able to do some po uh, early releases for, for the client. So that was a, a focus, but it was still there's a lot of debugging involved here. So here I'm just going through a lot of the numbers and uh, just showing an example. If we take a look at the fifth bullet example below, shows a full frame of video at the lowest rate. So in this example here is that uh, going using the DDR3s and, and I was using something like 50% efficiency uh, asset innovation. We, we typically get over 85% efficiency for our data, uh, for our data uh, flow to and from uh, our DDR. Uh, interfaces and I just wanted to show even with 50% uh, uh, efficiency that it would have been very, very uh, feasible to use the ARM core and power to be able to implement a lot of the test patterns and the example here is it allows uh, the ARM 26 milliseconds uh, in 30 frames per second requirement. So the things that we can do with uh, Stefan, the ARM is uh, unbelievable with that, matter, that amount of time. Would you agree, uh, Stefan? Yeah, so I mean, like, uh, what, what sort of frequency difference do we have on FPGA only versus the Icon 5? Yeah, so so typically we, we kept to the same frequencies, and uh, and I'll just go up quickly to the. So typically we we kept the, the same frequency here. So because we're using uh, typical uh, video uh, rates, it was like a hundred and. Uh, uh, 50 uh, megahertz in that range. So that, those were the typical frequencies we were using. Mm -hmm. And for I guess, the I guess uh, timing was timing was easier to reach because of the, the hardened uh, HPS. Yes, with the Cyclone 5 SOCO, it wouldn't have been an issue whatsoever. You know, and the DDRs were were running at uh, over 200 meg. We had to compromise and go down a little bit uh, for functionality, and we calculated everything just to be able to. You know, lower the amount of effort that you're going to put into trying to do time enclosure as opposed to it didn't really impact the, the schedule. Uh, sorry, e even uh, say for uh, doing the frame capture and stuff like that had very minimal impact. So, you know, we opted for that, which we wouldn't even had to for the Cyclone 5. So you're right, the frequencies uh, would have been uh, quite something uh, you know, right. uh, to use the highest frequency. So here we're, we're just going to move on into uh, you know, incorporating the trade-off time to so we'll, let's evaluate uh, what we see between uh, using the uh, FPGA only. And this is a traditional approach as opposed to an SOC. And again, just want to remind everybody that the real focus I was trying to uh, bring out here in, in the presentation is to say, hey, you know, let's rethink the way we architect. Let's rethink the way we attack our problem. Let's take advantage of the SOC. These designs are real. The tools are real. Uh, uh, absolutely true. It took me a day and a half uh, learning curve, installing the tool uh, to get a sample code going through uh, the first time when I saw this tool. And I just said, yeah, this is perfect. I'm familiar with all the tools and things like that. And there was absolutely nothing new. It only took a day and a half for the uh, licensing bill. So, I'll talk about that. <laughs> so here is just an example. And what I have in, in this sample here, and I, I'm going to finish off uh, very quickly just to allow people to ask any questions. And uh, we have the engineering hours. And what I have here is uh, the ARM estimate uh, versus uh, the actual NEOF. So as far as the, uh, if we take a look at what's highlighted in gray, the controller firmware spec, uh, that the spec took us a total of uh, about 94 hours, where it, the simplicity in what we would have done using the Linux environment uh, would have almost had that. Uh, similarly, with the, L, uh, the LDD, which is uh, Innovation's term for Logic Design Description for our FPGA, 
because it had a huge impact on them and we had to do uh, RTL code to be able to uh, interface uh, to the NEOS. So it was custom interfaces uh, for, the, for the NEOS in terms of that. So that also would have had a positive impact on that. The other uh, phase one total, so that's when we're actually designing everything in our logic design descriptions, our software design descriptions. And what we do is that we start implementing everything. And you can actually uh, take a look at uh, the reduction is, is throughout in both the, the coding and our simulations and everything like that. So it has significant impact being able to take advantage of uh, the SOC. So in total, I just want to show on the left-hand side is that in terms of uh, effort, in terms of cost, uh, we do reduction from 17 weeks to 12 weeks. And in terms of uh, hours, that was uh, a reduction uh, at 65%. So it was 30 and 35% of both calendar and uh, uh, effort. So it's quite significant when you're taking a look at uh, the benefits that the SOC has uh, to offer. I'll just uh, now I like a on that one. Yes. On the, uh, the ARM column there, does that assume any FPGA design reuse, or is that all from scratch? That's an excellent question, Todd. This is all from scratch. So today, if a client would ask us to do that, we have all this IP that we're talking about in, in this example. This is all innovation-owned IP. So uh, these numbers, um, a lot of them would actually be 30% of what you're seeing here. Okay, be even better with IP reuse. Even better because of the fact that we have existing IP. Great. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So uh, for testability and reliability, I want to give people an option uh, of uh, showing that um, there was additional effort uh, for us to be able to have some additional uh, testability. The one aspect, and I'm sure everybody out there would agree, is that the key thing that we really, really would love to do is to bring the abstraction level as high as we can, but you know, maintaining the optimal uh, implementation. So you know, there's been a lot of effort uh, throughout the years of hey, you know, just with, you know, 20 lines of code, you can generate this whole video pipeline. You know, that's the ultimate goal. What I'm saying here is that you know, by using uh, the ARM SOC, the, you've already brought the level of abstraction a lot higher. So creating test pattern, you know, if I need a, a JPEG uh, encoded test pattern or what have you inside there, and we actually have had that project where we'd have to implement all that in our tooling didn't warrant the effort to be able to do that. So instead, you just you, you try other things. But with that kind of uh, level of abstraction, say, oh, yeah, you know what? That's uh, maybe about three hours work for us to grab a little JPEG thing. We already have the interface. We already know uh, the communication, the data coherence is there. No problem. Let's test that out. Let's see how we do that. So that's one of the things that I want to really point out here is the fact that we have abstraction. Uh, going up, and it makes it a lot more viable to do a lot more testing, okay? Like abstracting the FPGA detail. And I think what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to thank everybody for uh, for the uh, slide presentation. I'm going to hand this back off to Joseph, and I want to allow people some uh, time to uh, pose uh, us some questions. Joseph, thank you, Alan. Um, Pleased to say that a lot of people hung on all the way through this presentation, so I, uh, I think it must be offering some value. I'll just get right into the questions immediately. Uh, the first question is from uh, Dave Mahoney, and he asked, uh, is the mask for that is presented able to turn on and off options for the different comp features in order to add more UART channels by removing DMA or CAN? I think that's a good question for, uh, for Todd. or. Uh yeah, yeah, sorry, you are going to repeat the question and follow the details on that one. Okay, and you should be able to see it now in your panel as well, Todd, so you can read it. It's it's a very read read kind of question. <laughs> so the question is, is the mask for that is presented able to turn on and off options for the different COM features? in order to add more UART channels by removing DMA or CAN? Yeah, I'm not sure what's meant by the, you know, the math on this. It's not like, uh, you know, an ASIC where it's taped out differently. Um, you would, in the FPGA fabric, you could build your own additional UART or DMA channels. 
Okay. Uh, the next question is, um, will these parts be a short-term offering like the Excalibur devices? I figured the part is Altera, so I pitched that over to you, Todd. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I appreciate your asking that, Stephen. Uh, no, they might be. Um, but first let me explain the Excalibur devices for the rest of the audience who may not be familiar with them. Altera did attempt a product like this uh, before my time, probably about 10 years ago, that integrated an earlier ARM processor along with an FPGA. And uh, it was really a product that was just a little bit before its time. Uh, back in those days, the processor space was still very fragmented with players like uh, MIP and PowerPC still out there in addition to ARM, uh, as well as I think the tools weren't quite mature, as we talked about today. And uh, last but not least, the pricing wasn't there. I think uh, there was value in this integration, and so prices are actually priced higher than uh, the current the, the combined solution would be. So now today, obviously, ARM has become the de facto standard. I think the tools have matured. Um, the pricing we've actually priced it to be more attractive than the, the standalone part. So I think it's an idea that time has come, and we're really getting great Great, thank you. Uh, and I would point out that we still we're still shipping a caliber to the people that did year, use that. So even though it was like a, a one time device, we're still shipping that ten years later to those customers showing our commitment to the product and those people are now moving to that with the FPGA. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Renee Bouchat. Uh, with the tools, will it be possible to debug NIOS two and the two ARM processors together? And uh, uh, first solution sir. is to look at it, it's it basically for the ARM processors. Uh, it will basically allow you to connect into the FPGA logic. Uh, but I, I believe Todd, you, you guys have a separate solution for NEOS too, uh, to, to debug, like the GDB, et cetera. Yes, that's correct. So you can indeed implement the NEOS 2 along with the FPGA, but then the debugging would be slightly different. Yeah, the debugging is, uh, is different, uh, but I can tell you right now that we've actually done stuff like that where uh, because, you know, I, I, I'm more of an FPGA guy than a firmware guy, and uh, I, we, we're not always working together closely. <laughs> so what happens is that I'll actually uh, implement a lot of, uh, let's say, the NEOS of the whole signal, and I'll get that to trigger something or what have you. So there are there's a lot of flexibility. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Alvin Takemi, and uh, I think this is one for you, Alan. If the video processing implemented in FPGA blocks uses most of the capacity in the system, what do you need the high-performance ARM Cortex-A9 for? Right. So one, one of the things is uh, what happened is that the ARM Cortex-A9, we had some uh, video pipelining. Uh, sorry. We had some uh, what we call the uh, uh, doing uh, captures, uh, video captures. So the video captures, uh, how would we get that across to the, uh, the PC? So what the ARM uh, was doing is uh, doing the communication uh, between the PC application and the FPGA, the video pipeline. There was a lot of setting up you had to do. There was some uh, auto white balancing settings. There was uh, some control settings uh, for the uh, uh, other boards that we had to uh, do. So there was a lot of uh, housekeeping. And then, as I mentioned, by using the ARM, we could have uh, utilized uh, the Linux system and Ethernet, and we would have been able to go at full throttle with the Ethernet. I, uh, trying to use, let's say, uh, just a NEOS uh, for Ethernet, uh, you just don't get full band. You wouldn't be able to do gigabit and things like that. So with the ARM, we would have been able to do that. So that was used for the user interface part. Thank you, Alan. The next question is from Renee again. Uh, will OpenCL be available for this architecture directly without PCIe interface? I think that's one for you, Todd. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's meant there by without the PCIe interface. Uh, I don't know that there's really any dependency on that for the OpenCL. Uh, but I will point out that we do have an OpenCL SDA tool, SDK toolkit available today. that supports the SOC devices, and we plan to support all the SOCs with that. Uh, on our website, there's also a great ray tracing demo that I would encourage people to look at. So OpenCL is definitely something that Altair has been very proactive on, and, and like just like SOC FPGAs, the OpenCL is being a, a great part of the, our future, and the, the marriage of those two is, is very powerful. 
Thank you, Todd. And the next question is for you as well. Uh, a lot of uh, interest here in, in, in uh, the product line. Um, when will the ARIA 10 dev kit be available? All right. First, let me explain uh, what the ARIA 10 is, uh, for those who may not have heard of it. But um, the ARIA 10 is our next generation SOC FPGA, and it's at a 20 nanometer technology. And it will uh, run at a 1.5 gigahertz uh, processor system. We decided to keep the same dual-core Army 9 because the dual-core Army 9, frankly, is very powerful and meets, the, meets or exceeds many of the needs today. And so by moving to 20 nanometers, then we get a uh, performance boost as well as a power table. Now, in terms of when the depth kit would be available, that's looking like early next year is when we'd have the depth kit for that. Uh, but I would point out, because it's the same processor subsystem, you can actually begin development with the ARIA 5 SOC dev kit today, and then that, that code would immediately begin uh, when it's available. So I say don't wait, get an ARIA 5 SOC dev kit, you can start today. Okay, terrific. And uh, another question for you, Todd. Um, what is Altera providing? Uh, this is from Nicola Tragic. What is Altera providing for uh, the customization of hardware IP blocks? Okay, yeah, another good question. Um, so to some degree, you can use the OpenCL for translating your C code into uh, the parallelized code and, and kernel for the, the FPGA. But more so, I think the key to answering this question is the QSYS system integration tool. So you can go off and you can design different hardware IP blocks in VHDL, Verilog, whatever your preference is, and then you can abstract as that a block into the QSYS, and then you connect it up to all of the AXI buses and everything in the QSI, Q, Q, QSYS excuse me, environment. So the answer to that question is really uh, take a look at the QSYS system integration tool. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next question, and I believe uh, is a good one for you, Alan. Uh, why is the pit map and top level HDL ports needed for HPS IOs? Aren't those signals hardwired, or is there some kind of programmable interconnection network between HPS and actual chip pins? I have to say I have a huge smile on my face. Uh, I was just reading that question before you read it to me, and I said, wow, I really would like to hand this off to Todd, because uh, the reason why is because that was one of the first questions I had when I saw this device come out. Talk, to be able to grab yeah, up. so the answer is um, there are various pin mucking schemes on the HPS um, peripheral pins. Uh, there's basically like four sets or four combinations you can use. So you do need to dig into the data sheet a little bit to uh, make sure that the specific combination you want is available. Um, that may be the, the difficult side. The, the, the good side is you can actually route uh, and share IO pins with the FPGA, so you can actually go out through the FPGA up to the HPS or, or vice versa in some cases. So there's there's flexibility, but it does take a little bit of, of work to dig in and make sure that the uh, the traffic you want to see is possible. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure, by the way, if we're going to get through all these questions in the time we have available. I'll keep going, uh, but if we don't. Um, what I'll do is I'll collect the person, uh, the, the question from the individual, and we'll actually uh, try to have somebody follow up with you and, and actually answer your question. So I really appreciate you taking the time to come here and pay attention and ask these questions, so we're going to certainly extend you that courtesy. Um, so the next question is from uh, Philip Van Hoot, and it is uh, one for you, Alan. Uh, is the FPGA part of the SOC purely a slave, or can the ARMS memory map be shared with the FPGA? How easy or hard would it be to implement? Ethernet offloading such as UDP encryption or synchronization points between Linux and NIOS, for example? That's an excellent question. Thank you, Philip, for that. The, um, the FPGA can share actually the memory map. So when we talk about the memory map, it's, it's really, depending on what the memory map is, there is a way in the uh, infrastructure, and even uh, Stephen, you'll have an opportunity to either quote me or tell me I'm right or I'm wrong. But there is actually a way, depending on what the elements are, because in the uh, periphery, some of these elements are can be memory map. There is a way, there is a bus that allows the FPGA to share uh, almost all the periphery with the uh, uh, ARM. And so you can do that. 
Uh, I haven't done that myself, but I know it can be done, uh, especially for the memory mapping and CDR and stuff like that. That could be shared. with really nice is that the dedicated CDR is not uh, memory controller is actually not just for the uh, ARM core. It is that the uh, actual FPGA has a path through that through one of the uh, cache uh, lines. So that's really nice. So the answer is yes, absolutely for that question. The next question is uh, how easy or hard would it be to implement Ethernet offloading, such as UDP encryption and things like that. Uh, the answer is actually quite simple. Uh, because of that data coherency and being able to uh, share, that's basically co-processing. So uh, that's what we've been doing for years and years and years is uh, adding co-processing abilities uh, between a, an FPGA and a uh, microcontroller. This makes it a lot easier. So the answer to that question is absolutely that can be done uh, quite easily. Thank you. I think we have time for uh, one more. Um, and I don't know who's going to want to answer this question, so I'll just read it out and you guys can jump for it. Uh, the ARM CPU will have to share the controller interface to the, oh, it's from Mehdi Taburi. The ARM CPU will have to share the controller interface to the DDR with another video pipe, other video pipeline blocks that need to access the DDR, such as frame buffers and filters. What is the impact of using ARM CPU and its bus, reading and writing to memory, on the performance of the system compared to the impact of using NIOS 2 and its Avalon bus? Um, I, I can answer that, Stephen, if you, if you, if you want ahead, to. Go ahead, no, I don't. You no, haven't had any, so. <laughs> but I, I can't tell you that. Fine, that's fine. You guys, yeah, you guys are doing a great job. Okay. So in, in the profiling example, is we are talking about that there was two DDR controllers. And one, one of the DDR controllers for this video pipeline uh, is, was reserved for actually just doing the video pipeline. Then we had another snapshot uh, DDR controller. And what I did is that in the uh, DDR uh, control space, and I you know, took a look at the, uh, how much uh, overhead it would take to be able to talk to the DDR. So when you put the code, depending on where the code is, if you put the, and how big the code is, and so for running Linux and stuff like that, is that uh, the majority of the time is that the ARM will be using uh, that DDR memory. Uh, the pipelining is a snapshot. So depending on what the requirements are or how fast we need the snapshot, like that, we can squeeze that in uh, very nicely through uh, arbitration of the bus, and that's handled automatically in the QSIS system. So we'll be able to automatically put that in. So in terms of RTL effort, it's, it's very low. Whether we use uh, a NEOS or we use the ARM, the, con the concept is identical. That's the beauty of it. So for a lot of those that are familiar with using NEOS and CDR and stuff like that, sharing memory, uh, we've done several designs where. The uh, processor memory is using the DDR as well as storage. That's the same concept here. There's actually no difference. That's great. Uh, I think we're going to have to, to stop it here. I, I am going to ask her one question, which was to me, and I, a couple of people have asked me already. Um, everybody who's attending the webinar will receive an email shortly within the next day or two um, with a link to the video version of this webinar so that you can access it and take more time to review the, the density of the slides that Alan presented and review everything. Uh, there are some questions here which uh, we, have, we have run out of time, so we're not going to be able to answer. And as I said before, I'm going to collect those questions and, um, and we're going to follow up with you and, and answer your questions. So um, I hope it was a good webinar for everybody and I'd like to thank you so much for coming. Um, most of you stayed through the entire webinar, so I hope that means that it was uh, very interesting to all of you. And I look forward to doing this again with uh, the engineering community. And thank you so much, uh, Todd, Stefan, and Alan for the time and energy you put into making this presentation for everyone. It's a real pleasure. Thank you.